Today we're doing something a little bit different because we're inside one of the cars that I own. This is a 2009 Saab 97X Aero. I bought the 97X because of its tow capacity, not because of the infotainment system in the dash. We did get the model with the factory navigation unit, but the nav system and the rest of the interface was definitely behind the times. Because we plan on keeping the 97X for a while, it was time to take a look at aftermarket infotainment and navigation systems. We chose a Pioneer infotainment and navigation system primarily because I've had a number of Pioneer units in the past and I really like the way that their interfaces work and the way the feature sets work. Counting backwards, this is actually my fourth Pioneer in-car navigation system. The inclusion of Apple CarPlay is one of the main reasons that I chose this system over some of the competitive systems out there. You'll notice that this screen looks very much like every other Apple device out on the market. Whether we're taking a look at the music interface right there or the mapping interface in the system, all of this is being generated by the iPhone 6 itself. This system allows you to control your iPhone without actually having to look at your phone itself. So if you're worried about some of those hands-free laws, this is definitely an interesting way around it. Let's start out our detailed dive at the home screen. You'll notice we have the Apple CarPlay logo right up here in the upper left-hand corner. If I had an Android phone plugged in instead, this would actually be using Android Auto. Both are supported in the system. We have the navigation software that's built into this particular unit. You can get Pioneer head units without navigation, of course. You'll notice we have only three inputs across the bottom, but there are more inputs than that. You'll see those if we click on this AV button, and then you can see all the variety of different AV inputs. You'll notice we have a camera view right here. That's because this system does support backup cameras or other cameras integrated into the system. Now, this particular vehicle that I'm in, the Saab 97 Aero, did not have a backup camera, but I could add one aftermarket and use it right there. We also have a rear entertainment setting right here because this does support two zones of entertainment. So you can have screens in the rear and use those for your rear passengers. Tapping again on AV reduces that menu. You can see we have a little arrow there to expand and contract. Clicking on the phone button takes us over to the phone interface that is part of Apple CarPlay or Android Auto because I have one of those phones connected. I have now unplugged my iPhone from the primary USB interface in the system so you'll no longer see the CarPlay logo here. I've plugged into the secondary USB port. You'll notice the music icon is now replaced with the album art. So if I click on that, we have full access to our iPod or iDevice or whatever USB media device you have right here in the system. We can pull open that menu. You can scroll through our playlist. The system does support scrolling gestures on the screen right there. This is a very snappy interface compared to some of those other Pioneer units I've used in the past, or even a decent number of factory systems. Once we've made a selection, obviously we get the album information, song information here, etc., and the album art. If we click on this menu again, it actually brings us back to the current playlist. So even if you're out digging around in a different playlist, for instance, but you're not actively playing that playlist, when you click on this menu option, brings you right back to the current playlist. The media screen gives you easy access to certain system functions. So for instance, we have our Bluetooth phone button right down there for quick access to the phone interface. Big play pause button right over here on the left side. We have again that menu button. We can access our equalizer by clicking right there. You can see your current graphic equalizer. Above that, we have a gear icon. This is where you access all the various vehicle system settings. We'll go over those a little bit later. Clock right up top. We can click right on the clock and change that. And then we can pull down this menu right over here on the upper left and change our input. The system supports scroll gestures and it'll only show you the inputs that are actually enabled in the system. So for instance, we don't have the XM tuner, so that's not showing up in this menu. Moving over to the radio interface, again, we don't have Sirius XM. We only have AM and FM in this particular system. If you had XM, that would be available also. This unit supports HD radio and 18 presets on FM. You'll find the preset buttons over here on the left side. We click this to expand it, or you can just click a particular preset. You can actually scroll through them. There are three different groups of presets, and you can scroll through them right there like that. Going back once more to the home screen, let's take a look at the navigation interface now. If we don't have a navigation destination entered into the system, we get this particular screen right up front. We can enter an address or a place right in here. Up top, we have California Auto entered, so we can just click on the street name that we want to navigate to and type it over here on the keyboard. You notice this is not quite as fast as some of the fastest modern infotainment systems, but it's a lot faster than a lot of the older navigation systems that we saw. This also supports scrolling gestures in the screen as well, which makes it easier to deal with. We want the Hinkley Road there in Burlingame. So we'll just go ahead and click on that particular option and then click go to street because I don't care about the house number. The system shows our destination on the screen and we can then pinch to zoom because this does support that if you want to navigate around and see exactly where it is that we're going. On the right side of the screen, we can choose to enable or disable certain navigation preferences like HOV lanes, ferries, toll roads, bridges, etc. The option on the lower right allows us a few more options. We can see places around the cursor. We can get detailed information about this location or save it. If we hit the detailed information button, it shows us the latitude and longitude, address, zip code, etc. We can hit the back button or we can just hit the set as destination button. We can then hit the start navigation button and the system will just start routing us there. 
because we are on an unpaved road right now, it doesn't have a next turn instruction. That would be up here. If we click this, we can actually see the itinerary and see how the system would like us to go. We can click on this particular option right here and see our trip computer for the trip summary, miles per hour, altitude, heading, time left, etc. It shows us our estimated arrival time. We have an hour and six minutes left and it's 52 miles away. Along the bottom of the screen, we have a display of what our iPod is currently playing. We have an option so that way we can change inputs. We don't have to leave the navigation screen in order to do that. And again, we have an option for easy access to the Bluetooth phone interface. Above that, we have an option to change the route in various different ways. We can see traffic if you have the traffic module installed in the system, detours, route summaries, cancel route, add waypoint, etc. This is also where you can enable or disable the 2D or 3D view. You can mark locations as favorites or as home destinations. And we can click the little person icon right here to select different user profiles. You can create profiles, and then when various people are using the car, they can pull up their profile or different profiles so that we can have a few things that are customized to you. You'll notice that now that we've been on this screen for a while, it has actually picked up a little bit of traffic information. This is being delivered by Clear Channel. It actually tells you the radio station that actually delivered this traffic information. We have relevant events and the delay. We can actually see a traffic map by clicking right there and then see how that delay may affect us by scrolling over to here. You can probably see that delay right there on the screen. You'll see it right there. That's that delay it was talking about. There's that little bit of red. It is a weekend, obviously. There's not too much traffic going on out there right now. As I said, this display is a pinched zoom display. It also offers topographical information depending on your zoom level. Once more back at the home screen, you'll notice we have some physical buttons across the bottom. We have volume up, down, map, which is that direct access button to that mapping interface. We also have the home button right here, which takes you back to that screen. A mode button, which will turn the display on and off. Dedicated track forward, backward. The last button on the right is an eject button. This is where you can actually change the angle of the screen to suit your vehicle or your particular preferences. But this is also where you can open the screen to insert either a CD or an SD card. You'll notice this opens all the way. We have an SD card slot right here where we can insert an SD card and we have an optical disc slot just immediately above that. Let's take a look at all the various system options by clicking on this gear icon. The first option is the favorites option because you can assign favorites to this particular menu. So you can actually click that one, for instance, and change your illumination, your theme, your background, your clock, etc. You can put just about anything you want in that favorites list. We then have regular system options. We can see navigation related settings, AV source settings, scroll and put output settings, camera settings. You can tell the system whether you want Android Auto to auto launch. You can adjust the picture, system settings, etc. On the color tab, this is where you can change things like background, your illumination, your theme, that sort of thing. We can choose between a variety of different color themes to better suit the colors of your vehicle that this is installed in. The speaker option is where you'll find the graphic equalizer. Again, we can click this little favorite button and then that will now show over here on the favorites list. It makes it easier to get the options that you frequently adjust. We have that equalizer that I showed you earlier, custom one, custom two, flat, vocal, etc. You can also adjust things like the fader, the mute level, the speaker, crossover, listening position, etc. The disc options where you can adjust things like your DVD player preferences because of course this does have a DVD player built in, subtitle language, menu languages, etc. Last but not least, we have the Bluetooth option. This is where you can adjust certain Bluetooth settings or add Bluetooth devices to the system. We'll go ahead and pair this phone so we can take a look at the phone interface. Click the pair option, agree to it over there. Now this phone is paired. The phone interface has a full dial pad. We also have the ability to switch back to the handset if we want to do that. Phone hang up pickup buttons a volume adjustment button for the microphone as well. We also have history, we have phone book, and we have our preset dials right there. We also have a voice command button over here if we want to activate that voice command system. It does do a Siri pass through since we do have that phone connected right now. Obviously, since I put this system in my own car, this is a system that I would recommend. The inclusion of Apple CarPlay in this system really is one of the critical features and one of the reasons that I selected this particular unit for installation in my own car. The Apple CarPlay interface just makes it very easy to interact with your smartphone. Of course, if you have an Android Auto device, same thing goes. It's just the interface is a little bit different. I actually prefer the way Android Auto's mapping system works to the Apple CarPlay system. But either way, this mapping interface is just snappier than most vehicles built in navigation interfaces. Obviously, this won't work if you don't have access to a cell signal. So you notice my cell signal is not too great right now. There are areas, of course, in the Santa Cruz Mountains where I live where there is no cell signal and the Apple CarPlay system won't work there. But then again, the built-in navigation database has a little bit of trouble finding out exactly where I am because the GPS signal is also a little bit iffy up here in the mountains. Now let's talk about the model lineup. There's the AVIC 8200, 7200, 6200, and the 5200. The one we've been taking a look at is the top of the line AVIC 8200. The four models fall into two basic categories. One has a seven inch screen and that's the 7200 and the 8200. 
The next level down is a 6.2 inch screen. The big difference between the two is that the seven inch screen has a motorized display. The reason the screen is motorized is so that you can have that seven inch screen, but you can still have an SD card slot, an optical disc slot, and of course the place to plug in that auto EQ microphone. If you didn't have the motorized display, you wouldn't be able to do that. And that's why we see the smaller display in the fixed display models. In terms of manufacturer suggested retail price, there is a decent difference between the AVIC 8200 at the top and the 5200 at the bottom of the pricing scale. However, in the real world, the difference is a little bit narrower. The AVIC 5200 can be found for about $750 and the AVIC 8200 for about $1,100. I have even seen some prices for the AVIC 8200 right around $1,000. With the price delta that is this narrow, my recommendation would be the AVIC 8200. It has the best screen of the bunch. That's the big difference between the 8200 and the 7200 is the screen. The 8200 uses a capacitive screen, just like my iPad here. The other models use a resistive screen like we see in older factory navigation units or for instance, your 1990s Palm Pilot. The capacitive screen is the newer technology. It's going to give you a more modern experience. Other than the screen size and the screen resolution, you'll notice over here that the rest of the feature set is very similar across the AVIC line. They all have the same resolution display. They all have a DVD player built in. They all have a 200 watt amplifier split into four channels. The number of inputs is essentially the same across the line and they all support optional XM satellite radio. They also come with Apple CarPlay standard. Now, an interesting twist is that they don't all get Android Auto standard. You do have to step up to the seven inch displays if you want that Android Auto feature. Apple CarPlay, however, that's supported on all four models. The other thing that changes as we go from the 5200 up to the 8200 is the navigation software. The 5200 does not give you live traffic, but the 6200 does. The 7200 then adds 3D landmarks. They're represented there on the map. You can see buildings downtown, that sort of thing. And then the 8200 takes it to the next level with improved, more natural voice commands. All four models also feature auto EQ and auto time adjustment standard. It's made possible via this little microphone right here. It's my only complaint actually is that this microphone is not standard. You do have to buy this separately. This one cost me 20 bucks, but it is $20 well spent. Something that a lot of people don't realize is that factory audio systems are generally tuned to the acoustics of the vehicle. And I'm not just talking about bass, treble, and mid-range. I'm also talking about digital signal processing because the rear speakers are further away from your ear than the front speakers are. And especially if you're the driver, that front left speaker, it's very, very close to your left ear. What most manufacturers do is they do a little bit of signal processing and they actually delay the sound coming out of that left front speaker. So that way in theory, it's reaching your head at about the same time as the sound from the rear speakers coming forward. That's where this little microphone comes into play. You plug it into the receiver. There's a little jack on the front of the AVIC 8200. You fold down the screen, follow the instructions, plug this little baby in, put it right on the headrest of the driver's seat and the system will automatically adjust not just the equalizer, but also the time delay of all four channels in the system. A decent number of high-end head units out there allow you to adjust the time delay for each channel, but there aren't that many that make it so easy to do automatically. This is definitely something that I would recommend you buy if you're considering any of these four units. Last but not least, we should talk about installation. That will set you back between three and $400, depending on the area of the country you live in and the vehicle you're installing the radio in. Something like the Saab 97X that I have, it needed a few modules in order to properly interface between the steering wheel controls and the radio. You can also expect to pay a little bit more if you want OnStar to still operate in your GM vehicle. That means that depending on the area of the country you live in and whether or not you do the installation yourself, you could end up out the door with one of the AVIC 8200s in your vehicle for as little as around $1,100 or as much as about $1,400, depending on those installation costs. Our installation was done by lots of Santa Cruz and they did a great job. So if you're in the area or you're in the Bay Area, I would highly recommend using them. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, this has been the Pioneer AVIC 8200 review. Go ahead and check out related views on my channel, see our latest car reviews. You can also find us over at facebook.com slash alexnautos, and I'll see you next week.